Okay, so let us continue from where we left off. We were, remember, we introduced the Legendre polynomials. We listed certain properties of Legendre polynomials. And now we are investigating the orthogonality properties of the Legendre polynomials. So we want to show that if k and l are non negative integers, then we have to show that pk and pl are orthogonal, namely integral minus 1 to 1 pkx plx dx equal to 0. They are orthogonal on L2 of minus 1, 1. So, pk satisfies the differential equation, pl satisfies the differential equation. We wrote the differential equation in self-adjoint form. Let's see what they are in the self-adjoint form. Let's look at the slide. It's ddx of 1 minus x squared pk prime plus k into k plus 1 pk equal to 0, which is display 5.10 in the slide. And ddx of 1 minus x squared pl prime plus l into l plus 1 pl equal to 0, which is display 5.11 in the slide. So now what do we do? We multiply 5.10 by pl and we multiply 5.11 by pk and we subtract and we integrate over minus 1 1 or you first integrate and then subtract it really doesn't matter. So what happens when you multiply 5.10 by pl and integrate you must integrate by parts when you integrate by parts what happens the ddx term will shift from one factor to the other factor. So you got p L into ddx of 1 minus x squared pk prime, the ddx will shift over to the pl factor. So, you will get pl prime pk prime 1 minus x squared. What about the boundary terms that you get when you integrate by parts? They are going to drop out because of the 1 minus x squared factor. It vanishes at 1 and it vanishes at minus 1. So, no boundary terms. So, when you multiply 5.10 by pk, L and integrate by parts, you get the term 1 minus x squared pk prime pl prime with a negative sign of course. Similarly, from 5.11, you will get again 1 minus x squared pl prime pk prime again with a negative sign of course over minus 1, 1 when you subtract these two terms cancel out. No boundary terms. So, what is left over? It is the remaining terms in 5.10 and 5.11 that contribute. So, it is k into k plus 1 minus l into l plus 1 integral minus 1 to 1 pk pl. Now, remember that when k and l are distinct non-negative integers and so this factor k into k plus 1 minus l into l plus 1 is not 0. Therefore, compulsorily integral minus 1 to 1 pkx into plx must be 0. We have completed the proof that the Legendre polynomials are orthogonal polynomials on the interval minus 1, 1. Now, this is okay, but what we want is a more convenient representation of the Legendre polynomials. Before we derive that convenient expression for the Legendre polynomials, we shall interpolate a small result from linear algebra theorem 50. I call this theorem fundamental orthogonality lemma. What is a fundamental orthogonality lemma? It says suppose V is a vector space endowed with an inner product and with respect to this inner product we got two orthogonal systems V0, V1, V2 etc w0, w1, w2, etc. Two orthogonal systems of non-zero vectors. None of the vectors are zero and they are both orthogonal. Further, assume that the linear span of v0, v1, etc. vk is the same as the linear span of w0, w1, w2, etc. up to wk for every k 0, 1, 2, 3. Remember this clause, I flag this clause for every k equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Then what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that vk is a multiple of wk for every k. 
Let us look at the proof of this. The proof is really an exercise. Rather than trying to do it algebraically, try to do it geometrically. In fact, if you think geometrically, you will quickly realize that this theorem is self-evident. There is really nothing to prove. Let us examine the hypothesis very carefully for every k equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Let us look at what happens when k is 0. Let us see what happens when k is 0. What does it read? Span of V0 equal to span of W0. It really means V0 must be a multiple of W0. It must be a non-zero multiple because both the vectors are non-zero vectors, remember? So, V0 equal to C0 W0 that we have verified. Let us not take k equal to 1. What does the hypothesis read? Linear span of V1 V0 is the same as the linear span of W1 and W0. But remember that this linear spans are two dimensional spaces. Span of V0 V1 equal to span of W0 W1 that is a two dimensional space. It is a plane. In this plane, V0 and W0 are already aligned to one another. But k equal to the case k equal to 0 gave us that V0 and W0 are already aligned in this plane. Both V1 and W1 are orthogonal to this line. V0 is a line, span of V0 is a line and that same line is span of W0. And V1 and W1 are both orthogonal to this line. Now in the plane, you got a line, you got a fixed line and the two vectors V1 and W1 are both orthogonal to this line. Therefore, they must both be collinear. In the plane, once I draw the line, there is only one direction which is perpendicular to it. And both V1 and W1 are in this direction. So, V1 must be a multiple of W1. So, V1 must be C1 W1. So, case k equal to 1 is done. Let us go to the case k equal to 2. Again, it says span of V0, V1, V2 is the same as span of W0, W1, W2. This is a three dimensional space. In this three dimensional space, already we have a fixed two dimensional subspace span of V0, V1 and span of W0, W1. They are equal and that forms a two dimensional subspace. And both V2 and W2 are orthogonal to this two-dimensional subspace. So, think of a three-dimensional space. We have a plane passing through the origin and there are only, there is only one line which is perpendicular to this plane. And along this line, both V2 and W2 are aligned. So, there is no option. V2 and W2 must be collinear or V2 must be C2 W2. This is how the proof goes in general. So, if you think geometrically, this is a fairly self-evident result. Or if you prefer to give an algebraic proof, go ahead and give an algebraic proof. But in any case, I would like to leave it as an exercise and I have given you a suggestion as to how to proceed. Now, let us use this fundamental orthogonality lemma to get a explicit and neat formula for the Legendre polynomials. Let us now consider the sequence of polynomials q and x equals the nth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power n. What is the degree of qn? Degree of qn is exactly n. Why? Because how is qn obtained? qn is obtained by taking the nth derivative of a polynomial of degree 2n. I have taken a polynomial of degree 2n, I differentiated it n times, I am going to get a polynomial of degree n. So, degree of q0 is 0, it is a constant polynomial. So, what is q0 of x? x squared minus 1 to the power 0 is 1 and I am not differentiating it at all. d to the power n upon dx to the power n when, x e when n equal to 0 means you are not differentiating at all. So, q0 of x is identically 1. So, degree of q0 is 0, degree of qn is 1, degree of q2 is exactly 2. 
So, we got a sequence of polynomials such that the degree of Qn is exactly n. Show that this sequence of polynomials is orthogonal on minus 1, 1. That is integral minus 1 to 1, Qnx, Qmx dx is 0 if m is not equal to n. Again, let us look at how to prove this. So, assume that m is less than n. Assume that m is less than n and let us multiply Qm and Qn. Qn is an nth derivative. What should I do? I should integrate by parts. I am going to transfer all the n derivatives from Qn onto Qm. Repeated integration by parts. I am going to repeatedly integrate by parts and shift all the derivatives from Qn and make it fall on Qm. So, the first time you integrate by parts, what is going to happen? You are going to get one derivative will shift. One derivative will shift from the qn factor to the qm factor. Of course, you are going to pick up a minus 1 when you integrate by parts. You are going to get minus integral minus 1 to 1 qm prime x into n minus 1 derivatives on x squared minus 1 to the power n. Plus, let us not forget the boundary terms. What are the boundary terms? It is going to be qm and n minus 1 derivatives of x squared minus 1 to the power n evaluated at 1 and evaluated at minus 1. Let us look at these boundary terms. Let us look at what happens to the stuff coming from qn. It is n minus 1 derivatives of x squared minus 1 to the power n. Now, look at the polynomial x squared minus 1 to the power n. 1 and minus 1 are roots, but these are roots with multiplicity n. These are both roots of multiplicity n. So, when does a polynomial have a root of multiplicity n? When the polynomial vanishes, its derivative vanishes all the way up to n minus 1 derivatives vanish. In other words, the n minus first derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power n is going to become 0 when I put x equal to plus 1 or when I put x equal to minus 1. In short, the boundary terms that you get when you integrate by parts drops out and you do not have any boundary terms. So, only thing that you get is the integral term with the derivative shifted to qm. Repeat the process again and again and again. Ultimately, all derivatives would have shifted over to the qm factor. At every step, you will check that the boundary terms drop out. And finally, you will get the nth derivative of qm. You get an integral involving the nth derivative of qm. Remember, m was less than n. Qm is a polynomial of degree m and you are differentiating it n times with n is bigger than m. So, you are going to get 0. So, that completes the argument that the integral minus 1 to 1 Qnx Qmx dx is 0 if m is not equal to n. So, we have checked that we have another sequence of polynomials Qn which are also orthogonal. Now, we want to infer that Pnx, the nth Legendre polynomial is going to be Cn times Qnx for a certain sequence of constants Cn. What is the natural thing to do? Appeal to the fundamental lemma. Appeal to the fundamental lemma. So, what is the vector space? The vector space is the vector space of all polynomials and what is the inner product? Integral minus 1 to 1 fx gx dx. That is an inner product space. We are looking at polynomials with real coefficients, real value functions. Now, we know that p0, p1, p2 are already orthogonal. 
we know that q0 q1 q2 etc are orthogonal so we got two orthogonal systems of non zero vectors namely p0 p1 p2 etc q0 q1 q2 etc in order to apply the fundamental orthogonality lemma what must we check we must check that the linear span of p0 p1 p2 up to pk is the same as the linear span of q0 q1 q2 up to qk for every k equal to 0 1 2 3 etc how does this follow how do we check this let us look at the following p0 is a polynomial of degree 0 p1 is a polynomial of degree exactly 1 p2 is a polynomial of degree exactly 2 etc so when you look at the linear span of p0 p1 p2 up to pk you're going to get all the polynomials of degree k and less because p0 p1 p2 etc are linearly independent they are different degrees so they're linearly independent and if i take the linear span of p0 p1 p2 pk i'm going to get a k plus one dimensional vector space namely the set of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to k plus one again q0 q1 q2 etc are linearly independent because they have different degrees so the linear span of q0 q1 q2 up to qk is going to be a vector space of dimension k plus 1 consisting of polynomials of degree k or less so we've got two vector spaces linear span of p0 p1 pk linear span of q0 q1 qk both of these are vector subspaces of the same dimension namely k plus 1 consisting of polynomials of degree less than or equal to k which is again k plus 1 dimensional space therefore they must be equal therefore linear span of p0 p1 up to pk must be the same as linear span of q0 q1 up to qk for every k we have verified this basic hypothesis that we need to apply the fundamental orthogonality lemma we have checked that therefore we can safely conclude that pk will be ck times qk and the claim has been established so we say that pnx equal to cn times qnx for every n now we must evaluate these constants cn how to evaluate this constant cn the obvious thing would be to put x equal to 1 if i put x equal to 1 in this equation what is the left hand side pn of 1 what is its value 1 pn of 1 is 1 that's how we define the pnx that's the normalizing factor pn of 1 is 1 is a normalizing condition so what is cn cn is going to be equal to 1 upon qn of 1 so all that we need to do is to compute qn of 1 to compute qn of 1 let us now check what that is look at this equation qnx equal to the nth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power n let us write x squared minus 1 to the power n is x minus 1 to the power n into x plus 1 to the power n we got a product of two things and we must apply the nth derivative of this so how to determine the nth derivative of a product of two functions you need to use the Leibniz formula for the nth derivative of a product you're going to get a number of terms one of the terms is going to be all derivatives fall on x minus 1 to the power n and no derivative falls on the term x plus 1 to the power n that's going to be one term with coefficient 1 the other terms we are going to have fewer than n derivatives on x minus 1 to the power n the next term is going to be n minus 1 derivatives on x minus 1 to the power n and one derivative on x plus 1 to the power n with some coefficient the next term will be n minus 2 derivatives falling on x minus 1 to the power n and two derivatives falling on x plus 1 to the power n etc now when you notice that when you have fewer than n derivatives falling on x minus 1 to the power n 
That means when you differentiate x minus 1 to the power n less than n times, you're going to be left with an x minus 1 factor. And you're going to put x equal to 1, remember? And that factor is going to be 0. So what is going to be left over? The only term that's going to survive is the first term. Namely, all derivatives fall on x minus 1 to the power n. Namely, you're going to get n factorial. And the other term is going to be left alone, x plus 1 to the power n. When you put x equal to 1, you're going to get 2 to the power n. So what is the value of qn of 1? It is going to be n factorial into 2 to the power n. What is the value of cn? 1 upon 2 to the power n into n factorial. That's exactly what we get. So pnx equal to 1 upon 2 to the power n into n factorial into the nth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power n. This is a formula that goes back to Oland Rodriguez. There's a very interesting history behind all these things. Rodriguez was, uh, was a very interesting mathematician. He was also an astronomer. You should look at the book review of a book by W.P. Johnson, which appeared in the American Mathematical Monthly in Volume 114, October 2007 issue. The link I has shared with you for the life and works of Oland Rodriguez. I may consult it if you like. So that is the explicit formula for the Legendre polynomials. Now what is the use of obtaining this interesting formula? Now we shall see how to use this Rodriguez formula. One way to do that would be to look at the integral of pnx squared dx from minus 1 to 1. You can use Rodriguez formula to compute it. You can use Rodriguez formula to calculate minus 1 to 1, 1 minus x squared pn prime x the whole squared or you can directly use a differential equation. I think the latter will be slightly easier. One more exercise, here we need the Rodriguez formula. Use Rodriguez formula to prove that the Legendre polynomial of degree n has precisely n distinct roots in the interval minus 1, 1. This is a very beautiful application of Rolle's theorem. So what is the use of proving this? So we know that the Legendre polynomial is an nth degree polynomial. And an nth degree polynomial will have n roots. But some of the roots may be repeated. Some of the roots may be complex. But the fact is that for these Legendre polynomials, the Rodriguez formula will enable you to prove that the roots are distinct and they are real and they lie between minus 1 and 1. So we got n distinct real roots in minus 1, 1. And remember that the Legendre polynomials are either odd functions or even functions. And not only that, the roots will be placed symmetrically with respect to the origin. So we've got a great deal of information about the roots. These roots are extremely important in numerical analysis because in 1814, more than 200 years ago, Gauss formulated his famous quadrature formula. So of all possible quadrature formulas for approximate numerical evaluation of integrals, the Gauss's formula gives you the least possible error. The, it is the best quadrature formula that we can come up with. A nice discussion of these Gaussian quadrature formula is given in the book of S. Chandrasekhar, his book on radiative transfer. Look at page number 56 to 69 of this book, which appeared in Dover publications. The reference is given on the slide. And these roots of the Legendre polynomials play a very, very important role in numerical quadrature. It's called Gaussian quadrature in the literature. I think we'll stop here and we'll continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you.